Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. Do you know we've had the best summer of surf of, of my entire life in Waikiki Beach? There's been even 30 foot swells out here, uh, tow in conditions where you have to be towed in by jet ski in order to catch them. And for that whole, um, most of the summer, I was rehabbing a torn muscle in my in my hip and I was not allowed to go out. Uh, it was really It was really suffering, but I just have this sort of assurance that now I don't have to go to purgatory because I've done all my all my spiritual work here, suffering watching all these great waves go by. But we're glad to be joining you. We have our guest today, Father Jeffrey Kirby, who is uh, the author of a new book, Understanding the Bible. So in less than 40 minutes, you're going to understand the whole Bible. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm working on a new book called... uh, 12 Rules of Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? And I'm using a lot of uh, quotes from one of my favorite authors. No, it's not Augustine. No, it's not Plato. No, it's not Aquinas. It's Louis L'Amour. Louis L'Amour was a Western man raised uh, in North Dakota, where actually I was born. Uh, only lived there a few years of my young life. But his his cowboy books, as I call them, are so thrilling. He's written over a hundred of them. I have the uh, leather bound edition of each one of them. I used to get get one of them a month in the mail, and they always start out with kind of a gunshot or something really thrilling, something exciting, um, and and you're just drawn into the story of of really the good guys and the bad guys, which is really a story of the earth, of the way the earth is. And uh, it's action-packed, and uh, the hero is not always perfect. Sometimes he has self-doubt and has to grow to, to become the hero of the book. But um, it, it's, it reminds me of Scripture. I mean, you know, think about how the Bible starts out. It starts out with a big bang. You know, in the beginning was the, you know, well, now, now I'm quoting uh, uh, John 1. But, in, you know, it talks about in the beginning, the, the, the um the beginning of the earth, beginning the beginning of creation. It's like it's it's louder than a whip uh, snapping in a Louis L'Amour Western. It's 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 more exciting than a than a Bro- I guess it's Bruckheimer movie. The guy who did Star Wars. Uh, the Bible is the Bible is action packed. It's full of uh, people that you probably the way you probably wouldn't present uh, the heroes. You know, they're uh, the, David was a murderer, for example. You know, uh, Moses was a murderer. Uh, David uh, slept with someone else's wife. I mean, and yet these became the heroes of Scripture. And so the Bible is just full of, of great stories. And it's interesting how the library is not, the, the Bible is not a book that you read through like chronologically. It's actually a library full of stories. And why is that? Because you're a story. From the beginning of time when God said, let there be light, he already knew you. The Bible says before uh, you were planted in your mother's womb. I knew you. From the foundations of the earth, I knew you. And God has a great adventure for you. God has a great story for you. By the way, Louis L'Amour, Louis L'Amour says the word adventure is just a romantic way of saying someone faced an awful lot of adversity and overcame it. But that's a, that's a lot about the quality of our life. So when you read the Bible, let it, it, it can come to life for you. As you read these stories and the books of the Bible, you come to grips with the fact that, you know, you're a story and and history is his story and so um uh we've got father jeffrey kirby here to open up kind of crack open the the bible for us uh, and and begin and become more friendly with it for some people it just seems like it's such a an unusual book you know you say i'm going to start with genesis and read it all the way through and i've never really met anybody that's done that although i guess i say i I have done that one time uh, I, I read the whole New Testament and then the Old Testament and then the New Testament again in about a six-week period, and it was really a cool time uh, in my life to get to go through that. But most people don't, who start out reading Genesis kind of get stopped somewhere about Leviticus or Deuteronomy. <laughs> but Father Jeffrey Kirby, thank you so much for being here. Father Jeffrey is the pastor of Our Lady of Grace Parish in Indian Land, South Carolina. He is a moral theologian. 
which is pretty gnarly. And pay, someone asked me today at coffee, so what is a moral theologian? I go, I, I don't know. I don't know. And he's papal missionary of mercy. He serves as the adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey College. Father Jeffrey Kirby, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Thank you, Bear. It's good to be back on the show. Hey, why did you write this book? <laughs> well, you know what happened was I kept seeing that there was a real desire among my, my parishioners and among you know just the faithful of to, you know real desire to know the scriptures to to dive into it and and oftentimes what was happening is that zeal just didn't have a lot of direction or a lot of basic resources and so as I just began to look and say you know what what would be the best help like what what could be provided and I thought. Well, you know, maybe just a rundown, almost like a bullet point summary of each of the 73 books of the Bible. And, and that really kind of gave birth to understanding the Bible. Again, very practical, uh, easy to read, a summary of each book of the Bible. So it, it, it's not some, uh, you know, there are a lot of good resources in terms of uh, beginning Bible reading. But this one I hadn't really found. I thought, I, I think this could be a helpful resource. So, so really re kind of responding to just movements among the hearts of God's people I kept observing like, people want to read the Bible they want to get closer to the scriptures yeah it's so, it's just so cool uh, this book you know people come to Hawaii and they go hey I'm, I want to learn to surf or should I rent a surfboard and I tell them well you should probably uh, get a uh, one of the Beach Boys to take you out and teach you you need a coach right yes. you just don't get on a surfboard and surf and that's the way of the scriptures too when you get in the in the outrigger canoe with father kirby and he begins to guide you uh, uh you know through all these all the different waves of the bible you really are going to get you're really going to get deeper faster and have a lot more clarity when when you read it what, what's the difference between you know I, I went to baylor university i'm wearing my baylor shirt right now because they're doing, yeah, doing football I, I was a catholic going to a baptist university and oh man they love the bible they just love the Bible. And I had to take Bible overview classes. And I learned, oh, man, when I took my Old Testament survey class, I was just, just so enthralled with the characters uh, of the Bible. What is the difference between the Catholic and the Protestant Bible? Yeah, so, so the big difference is the Old Testament. Uh, there's a disagreement on how many books are in the Old Testament. So uh, as Catholics, we say 73 um, Protestants would say, well, seven of those, uh, they argue, were added later. Uh, we disagree with that. So during the Reformation, those seven books were removed. So that's the main difference. So thanks be to God, we all agree in terms of the New Testament, that there's 27 books in the New Testament. The Old Testament, there's a debate over these seven books. Um, you know, do, in our tradition called the Deuterocanonicals, sometimes Protestants refer to them as the Apocrypha. But uh, it's these seven books that are the disagreement. So, so that's the difference. But I will say what we have in, in common is the understanding that this is a living word. Mm. That when we speak and, we, and when we read the scriptures, uh, God is speaking to us. That you know He wants to, to move our hearts, and, and and that's something we share. Every baptized Christian shares that you know, the scriptures are a gift given to us by God in order for us to hear our Father speak to us. Well, I always. Thought I would use well, when I was at Baylor. They said we should use the Bible that Jesus used. That's the that's the St. James Bible. <laughs> 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 but isn't it isn't it true that some of the New Testament quotes come from the Septuagint, which has the absolutely Deuteral, they, it has the ex, those writings, doesn't it? Exactly. I've seen yeah. articles written that there are almost four hundred direct and indirect references to the Deuterocanonicals in the public teachings of the Lord Jesus. So I just like to use the Bible Jesus used. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And really, if we look at the life of Second Temple Judaism, so the Judaism that our Lord would have practiced, it was heavily steeped in the influence of the Deuterocanonicals. Uh, so it was like the, po the time after the exile, the Second Temple, mm -hmm. that, that molded and shaped the whole understanding of God and worship and theology that drastically also affected devotional life and understanding of eternity. Uh, so, so there's a lot here in terms of, of when we speak about this discrepancy of the books and, and how the Old Testament came together that really it would be hard-pressed um, to, to try to argue that these seven books were not a part of the Lord Jesus' way of life and his public teachings. Well, originally I think uh, Martin Luther kicked out the book of James too and then brought it back as an appendix and eventually was brought back into the New Testament. Yes. So there was a lot of controversy there. But So we're, we're, we're thankful that we have uh, all the books of the Bible available to us. I, I especially love the book of Sirach, the book of wisdom. Yes. Um, Amen. Tremendous, tremendous wisdom in those books. I'm glad I'm, I'm not missing out on those. Okay, so why don't you give us just a... We got a minute and a half before our first break, but give us an overview of the Bible. You know, the Old Testament, the New yes. Testament. Just give us that quick 
rundown before we come back and dig in. Yes, I think the big thing we can start with is, so there are 73 books in the Bible, 46 in books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. And the best way to approach the Bible is to understand it's a library. So it's not a singly composed novel you know, in, in the popular sense of you start on page one, you read all the way through, but rather it's, it's a library of multiple different literary genres throughout thousands of history. One author, one message, of course, God is the principal author, but multiple different books, and that has to be very much understood as we approach the scriptures in order for us to not be overwhelmed or to hit that Leviticus wall after uh, trying to read the Bible, you know? So, so a little bit of knowledge goes a long way, and the first piece of knowledge I would really assert is approaching the Bible and understanding it as a library. Okay, when we get back, we're gonna talk about, is the Bible the inspired word of God? We're talking with Father Jeffrey Kirby, uh, his book, uh, Understanding the Bible, you need to, everyone should have this on their shelf. It's just a great uh, way to get traction in reading the scriptures. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue through Bear's Man Cave community in our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been and how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion? Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. My publisher, Sophia uh, Press, has asked me to encourage you to go to uh, the, my website, deepadventure.com, and to our store, and uh, you can pick up uh, copies of my, my two books that they recently published, The Surfer's Guide to the Soul and uh, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, and we're currently in the process of working on 12 Rules of Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? It's a book on manliness, and it's based on Father Jeffrey Kirby's life. That's why we have him here today. Father Jeffrey, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Thank you. Good to be back. <laughs> uh, so so uh, I wanted to talk about uh, in the, in the, um, how, do we, how does the church tell us to, to interpret Scripture? How does the church tell us? Is it the inspired Word of God, you know, um, the essence yeah. of what the Bible is? Yeah, so very much we know that it's it's that the that the Bible the principal author is, is God Himself, but we know as as you know theology gives us this you know popular maxim that it's the Word of God in the language of man, which means obviously there's a human author. So if that human author had deficiencies, for example, in education or or scientific understanding or cultural perspectives, that that would have all played itself out because it's the Word of God, but it's being written through a human instrument. You know, I, I very much like St. Paul when he says, you know, we hold this treasure in earthen vessels. Mm. So imagine God's heavenly treasure is held within the fallenness of humanity. Well, in the same way that that applies to the scriptures, that you know, we're, God is communicating His words, the Word of God, but it's through human instruments who are fallen, who have mm. perspectives and understandings that may not directly conform or perfectly conform with the Word that is being given to them. So, whenever we approach the scriptures, a little bit of knowledge is very important in terms of, you know, what is 
the inspired word of God, you know, how are we supposed to apply, apply this? Uh, you know, what are the clarifications, the context that, that you know, we should you know, bring with us in terms of understanding what God is saying? And, and I think that these small things can help us, again, just to, to really allow God to speak to us and understand what he's trying to say to each of us in terms of where we are, what's going on in our lives. It goes to the basic relationship of God with man. God didn't make us robots. I, I, I know when I was younger, I thought, well, God took someone's hand and just started writing the scripture through that person. You know, like God mm -hmm. dictated, God didn't dictate it. He inspired it. It's a little bit different sense. And so, and I love that because it's saying that in every work of God, uh, you know, he works, he chooses to work through men. And in every every work of God through men, it's going to have that person, that you know, the unique unique gifts and callings and experiences of that person interwoven into that. And that's that's that that goes to that personal relationship that we have with Jesus. It's the inspired word of God, but He actually, um, uh, you know, gifted that to us through a human being, and it has that flavor, the the taste of. The, the writings of one of one book of uh, Job is very different than the writings of Isaiah, you know, yes. but yet it's all the inspired word of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, in, in understanding the Bible, what I try to do with the, you know, there's 73 books of the Bible. And so the book has 73 chapters. Every chapter reflects the book of the Bible. And just as we're talking about bear each chapter just kind of goes to the you know the nuts and bolts the basic like what's the what's the message what's the context you wrote this what are some key words um, what are some main themes where where are some initial passages that we can read in order to try to understand that book there's also an application part that was one of my favorite parts of you know how do we apply you know a part of this sacred book in terms of our own lives and then every chapter begins and ends with prayer just to show that you know, our approach to the scripture should be marked by a prayerful spirit. We should have mm -hmm. open hearts. So in, in a very simple way, very approachable way, um, the book so seeks to kind of unpack uh, each book of the Bible. So it's not intimidating. So people can say, oh, wait, I, I got this. This makes sense. I, I, I can I can I, I can read the Bible. I can understand this. And of course, that's a great victory, because once you begin to engage the word, God speaks. And when God speaks, things get done. Hearts are changed, hearts are healed. So I, I was excited about writing the book. I, honestly, it was, it was a labor of love. Uh, going through all 73 books of the Bible, was, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a good review and education for me. Um, but it was a labor of love, but I enjoyed doing it because I really have a desire and I have a great hope that you know, more of the Christian faith will understand how to read the Bible and receive its, its biblical wisdom and receive the wisdom of the, the scriptures that the, you know, the, the, the Bible wants to give to us. Yeah, it's like, um, well, there's a verse, taste and eat. You know, once you start, I tell you what, Father, my wife made this sauerkraut soup the other day for me, kapusta soup. It's a Ukrainian. It sounds terrible, but it's so good. Once you take one bite, you can't stop. You want more. And that's where mm. the scripture is, as you begin to, to taste and eat, you want more. Mm. And it's so beautiful because yeah. uh, I love what G.K. Chesterton said. I believe it was G.K. that talked about the, the virtues, how the, the four cardinal virtues are kind of virtues of restraint, but the three theological virtues are just, you can just let go of completely because you're focusing on an eternal, infinite being. And that's what Scripture brings you. You can never get enough of Scripture. And the, the word, uh, in, I think it's in Joshua 1 and in Psalm 1, it mentions meditating on God's word. And the word only, uh, that's I think is the only two places the word success is, is, uh, is also, meditate on God's word and success will attend all you do. Uh, what, what is our, what is the word, what is that Christian form of meditation on God's word? What is that about? Yes, yeah. So, so as we approach the scriptures, of course, you know, that, that prayerful spirit should be a part of it. We actually have multiple different prayer forms associated with the scriptures. Uh, probably one of the more popular is, is called Lexio Divina, mm -hmm. which just means a sacred page, divine page. And it's basically when we just take a part of the scriptures and we just sit and reflect upon it. So you can imagine taking one verse or even something less than a verse and just sitting there and keep you know going back to it, going back to it and having this kind of prayerful, you know, God, God's almost unpacking um, this this divine word. He's he's peeling the onion as we are engaging in prayer. Uh, the prophet uh, prophet Jeremiah says, you know, we we, we munch, we, we gnaw on the word. Mm -hmm. And so this Lexio Divina, we just sit and we begin to reflect it. And suddenly this small verse or or portion of a verse suddenly begins to become an ocean in front of mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. where it's like, wow, I didn't realize that had so much depth or meaning mm -hmm. or purpose or power, mm -hmm. you know, in this one one little verse or, or 
part of a verse. So that's one of the many prayer forms associated with the Bible. The, the, the big thing, especially for, for new Bible readers, is just to have some type of prayerful spirit. We're, we're not reading ancient literature. We're not reading the Iliad or the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. We're not reading a history book. Uh, this is God's continual messaging, His continual speaking to us. So when we read the, the scriptures and God speaking to Moses, He's not only talking to Moses, <laughs> He's talking <laughs> to us. <laughs> you know, when, when God is speaking to the prophets or, or speaking through the prophets, uh, He's not simply acting thousands of years ago, He's acting right now today mm -hmm. and speaking to us as well. So, so it's, it's a living word, we, we wanna kinda uh, you know, realize that more and more. I think that that's been lost in, you know, in, in terms of a lot of Christian uh, believers, that's a living word. That you know, you can imagine, um, you know, if, if I was somewhere and there was, you know, um, radioactivity, I wouldn't see it. You know, it would get mm. inside me. It would mm -hmm. have some type of, you know, I think of the uh, mini series they did on Chernobyl. You know what I mean? Like, and um, and yet the same with the Word of God. Like it enters us. We can't see it. You know, but but we can begin to see the fruit that's born from it. Mm -hmm. Right. So. So I think in the same way, it's like it's a living word. It's like if I was eating a piece of fruit and I realized that while I was eating the fruit, I somehow had eaten a, a worm, mm -hmm. and this worm is now inside my body, right? This mm -hmm. living thing, you know, in, in a similar way. I mean, whatever examples we want to draw from, in a similar way, it's, it's, this is a living, active thing that we are engaging with. The Word of God is, is living and active. The scriptures tell us it cuts to the marrow, mm -hmm. right, to, the, to, 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 the, to the difference, you know, that, that center between soul and spirit. Mm -hmm. So I think when we speak, when we pick up the, the scriptures, we want to make sure we have that prayerful spirit. We open our hearts and say, come Holy Spirit, speak to me, tell me, instruct me, admonish me, console me, affirm me, guide me, whatever, whatever needs to be, like just speak to me. And, and God will, he speaks to us through the scriptures. I was, thinking, you, I was thinking about the same verse you just referenced, Hebrews 4.12, I think it is, where it says that the, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between spirit and soul and the joints and the marrow and seek out the secret thoughts and intentions of the heart. Um, people sometimes come to the Bible like they want to dissect the Bible. Like, I'm going to take a modernist view and I'm going to slice it. Like Jefferson, I think, actually did slice parts of the Bible out, right? He did, um, yeah. And they, they want to dissect, uh, let's just, you know, Dice, let's let's dig into this and we'll find out what I believe or don't believe but actually the word of God is very dangerous um, it's a sword and yes. it's going to dissect you and, and it's going to reveal you and expose uh, the deepest part of your soul uh, to actually the surgeon's hands the Bible also says the wounds of a friend heal it's a surgeon's knife that will bring healing to you. But don't think that you're going to read the Bible. It's going to read you. It's going to have mm -hmm. a, trem a, a, tremendous, uh, a tremendous impact on you. And so we're encouraging everybody, you should have this in your library right next to your Bible, Understanding the Bible, a Catholic Guide to Applying God's Word in Your Life. Uh, with Father Jeffrey Kirby, um, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Oh, Father, how can they find you? I'm sorry, I wanted to ask you that. Oh, yes, yes. So my website, frkirby.com, and then on Twitter, uh, at Father Kirby. You, you, I really dig on Father Kirby. I heard him interviewed on EWTN once, and I thought, i got to get to know that, guys. So, so thank you <laughs> so much. We'll be back, back with more Father Kirby in a moment. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book, and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. This is Daniel the Boone Markham with another episode of Country Up. Grit. Grit. That is true grit. It's one of my favorite terms. It's a word I use a fair amount in my forthcoming post-Civil War Western novel, Revenge and Redemption. Whether you got calluses or not doesn't determine a man or a woman of true grit. You can be a preacher or an office manager and have true grit. True grit comes from, well, gritting your teeth in tough conditions and then keeping your gear in action. A man or a woman with true grit just doesn't have quit doesn't mean there's no fear involved, 
nor the shaking of hands or knees. I've had to grit things out in terrifying conditions. No doubt so have you. Jesus walked willingly to the cross of crucifixion, all the while sweating drops of blood and fighting depression. But he got her done. That's what counts. Dr. Luke in his gospel wrote that Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jesus was determined to realize his destiny through the cross. Dang, that sure is true grit. The Apostle Paul had one tough haul in bringing the gospel to the Roman Empire, writing, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. He had that keeping on, keeping on deal. Man or woman's got to know what's worth standing for and then standing for it no matter what the opposition, mistakes, setbacks, or number of battles lost during the war. It ain't over till it's over, partner. You'll be known less of a man or woman when needing true grit if you call out to the Lord for his courage and his faith and his power. Jesus did. Paul did. I do. Shoot, I do it nearly every day. True grit. Get it? Got it? Good. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter? even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps. Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We have our guest, Father Jeffrey Kirby, with us. I want to remind everybody, my sons, uh, Shane and Joshua, they work so hard on producing our radio show, and the, they are the, 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 the muscle behind uh, our TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. And we have some good news. Um, season three is now up and active on Prime Video. So seasons one, two, and three, there's 22 episodes that are live uh, uh, on Prime Video, so you can go there and watch it. Or you can go to deepadventure.com and become a mama bear or a member of the man cave. And then you get access to all of our long ride home TV shows, the motorcycle based uh, immersive reality show that is, by the way, Tally award winning. You can get you can get access to all those even before it's aired on EWTN. And we're fast coming to the point where we'll be delivering season four of long ride home. And that is our uh, it's the beginning of our adventures on on uh, on the on the island of Oahu. So it's kind of cool bringing bikers to paradise. It's kind of fun. Really was a blast. We have with us today Father Jeffrey Kirby, and we're talking about scriptures. The Word of God isn't just a a book, though. It's a, it's a person. Amen. Tell us about the Lord that. made flesh. Yeah. Tell us about um. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. So we can imagine all the revelations of God, you know, all the sacred accounts of His words and deeds. All of them became flesh in Jesus Christ. So he is the Word made flesh, the utterance of the Father made flesh. And that's important for us because that means Jesus Christ becomes the main source of interpreting and understanding the Scriptures. We look at his life, his teachings, and that becomes you know, the basis, the standard for our entire understanding of the Scriptures. So if we read a part of the Scriptures and we're not sure what it means or what's the context, we can go to the life of Jesus Christ, and there we find that mean, that, that context uh, that that application, you know, that, that living expression of what God has spoken, what he has revealed about himself. He is called the Word of God. I mean, Jesus is the Sophia, the Logos of God. And uh, and so it's so interesting when he stood before Pilate uh, and Pilate was asking him some questions and then he made this kind of um, cynical statement, what is truth? And truth is a person. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus was standing. Truth was standing right in front of him. In this time, in this age, we need um, the truth of, of Scripture more than, than ever. 
Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. As as it uh, as we see more and more the culture returns to darkness, you know, then we need to bring more light. And one mm-hmm. of the ways in which we can bring light, you know, is, is to regular understanding and application of biblical wisdom. I, I love the expression uh, that you know a dark age is not when the lights go out, but when the lights go out and no one notices. And I think the way in which we keep our inside our perspective in place is by reading the sacred scriptures. So when the lights go out, we can recognize that they've gone out, and then by the th- by sacred scripture, we have divine wisdom. We have the light that we can bring back uh, into the darkness of our world. You know, Father, when I was a, I'm a CPA. I know it's shocking, <laughs> but I am. And when I was a young CPA, I was uh, working for Deloitte at the time, and we audited banks. And I remember walking in uh, the day my my daughter was born, my first child was born, and walking in to audit to go out of the bank. They sent me home right away though because I pulled the bait money, accidentally, you know, and uh, alarms went off. But they taught us then that the, the tellers are never taught how do I how to recognize counterfeit money. They don't say, well, this is, it can look like this, it can look like this, it can look like this. They're just taught to recognize real money what a genuine $20 bill looks like. So we don't have to learn every heresy and every, we don't have to identify every single uh, falsehood out there. What we need to do is know the scripture and, and, and read the catechism along with it in a book like this along with it so that we know what the real thing is. So that when, yes. to, when falsehood is printed to it, presented to us, and that's, that's all Satan does is he, he, he just takes scripture and twists it a little bit. Every truth is always mingled Every lie is always mingled with a bit of truth. We need to know the real so we don't bite, you know, bite on the counterfeit. Yes, yes, yes. And, and the best resource for that is, as you were saying, reading the sacred scriptures and reading the catechism of the Catholic Church. Because, you know, we're fallen. Like, <laughs> whatever wisdom we have, uh, you know, there, there are some problems with it. Uh, but when we receive divine wisdom, so the wisdom given to us from God, uh, it's perfect. And so I, I love the scripture that says, you know, uh, his teachings, his laws is a lamp unto our feet. So we can imagine in the midst of the darkness to have a lamp that's going to be able to guide us. And, and that's the word of God. That, that's what we have received in the sacred scriptures. And it goes back to the fact that if it's a lamp unto your feet, you're supposed to be going someplace. And it harkens <laughs> back to our first conversation that we're on a journey. We're on an adventure and we need that light. But here, here's the problem is I have a good friend of mine, Bubba Hicks. He was president of a bank in Texas. He used to be on my high school football team and Baylor student. He was one of the, in the Hall of Fame from Baylor football. And he, he, when I went out to my reunion recently to Texas, he, he said, I want to talk to you about something. And it was all about the authority um, – who has the authority to interpret Scripture? Because remember Martin Luther said, basically, Scriptures, anyone can understand the Scripture, and, and, and you can basically interpret it and, and all that you need to know. And then he and Zwingli had an argument pretty quickly and, and, and broke up over their disagreement about Scripture. So Scripture, it turns out, isn't necessarily all that easy, and you need an authority. And so tell us about why it's important to have that catechism, why it's important to understand, to bring along with Okay, to bring along with your reading of Bible the authoritative teaching of the church, because, by the way, it was the Catholic Church that put it all together originally. Yes, yes. Yeah, if, if I can begin with an example, um, imagine if you have a husband and wife, and they have you know, their whole marital relationship and their exchange and their, uh, their loves and their acts of forgiveness and kindness and so on, and, and yet you were then to find uh, a series of emails that they had exchanged at different times, you know, throughout their married life. And you were to just take those emails and put them together and say, this is the totality of the relationship between this man and this woman, right? Well, both the man and the woman would laugh, right? Like, no, those are, those are written accounts of the living relationship. And it's only by understanding the living relationship that you can understand what those emails mean the context, the purpose, and so on, the jokes, the hidden meanings, and so on, right? So if we can understand that, you know, in order for us to understand the scriptures, we need the living relationship of sacred tradition, because it's from tradition, this interaction between God and his people, that we have the scriptures born. And the scriptures are simply written accounts of portions of this living relationship between God and his people. And the sacred tradition has shepherds who've been appointed, guided by the Holy Spirit, 
appointed by God in order to continue to interpret and apply what this what this living tradition, what these sacred scriptures as well mean. So we say now we have the written word of God and we have the verbal or oral God, well, word of God. So sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and we need both. Oftentimes there are parts of the word of God that are not contained in the written word of God. There's not mm-hmm. in the Bible, yeah. but we rely on sacred tradition. Or there are parts of the written word of God where we're just not sure exactly what that means. But once we put it back in the relationship, oh, of course, it makes complete sense. Mm. And then, of course, we have those who've been appointed to interpret and apply the scriptures, the magisterium, the pope, the bishops, in, you know, in the new covenant, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, then we realize, okay, good. So, you know, there's... Now here God is continuing to, to act among his people. God is guiding us through these appointed shepherds. So anyone who says, I don't need these shepherds and interpreters, I don't need the living tradition, I'm just going to take the Bible and I'm going to interpret it according to how I think it should be. It'd be like the foolish person that took those few emails between a husband and wife and said, I can know everything about the relationship between this man and this woman by this collection of emails that I happen to have received, right? And, and, and again, anyone who would say that, the, if we were to hear that, we would say, you can never understand the relationship between this man and this woman by simply reading these few written emails. You have to understand the people, the, the interaction, the lived relationship. So again, in the same way, we need sacred tradition, we need the magisterium, if we're going to be able to fully understand the sacred scriptures. And by now, the way, well, go ahead, sorry, yes. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go no, ahead. And, and I was saying, like, if someone were to remove tradition and the magisterium, is God still going to speak? Of course. Will he be able to be fully understood? Will we have the context for what his word has said to us? No, we will not. We need tradition. We need the magisterium. That, that's that's just it's just so so powerful. You know, and, and it was, Paul himself said that which I've spoken to you, that which I've written to you. So you have that oral tradition right there, and he says, "Hold fast to the traditions that I've taught you." And and yes. so there there are, even in scripture itself, it, it it reminds us of the importance of that. But you know, to 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 go to. Um, the early t- uh, years of the church and all the heresies that were battled through. Thank God for Athanasius and 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 and, and the, the the Greek scholars and uh, but but every 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 heresy that that attacked the church was really became an opportunity for clarification and for more highly distilling. Uh, you know. The Arian heresy, there was a time when Jesus was not. You know, he was the highest created being, but he's not God. He's not equal to God. Well, that's kind of the Mormon heresy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but but uh, there, there's no heresy that we see today that wasn't already. <laughs> it's just, right. a re, just a remake of the past. But it helped us to purify and distill and to distill our understanding. But thank God that the, for the er, these books behind me by the early church fathers that wrestled and tumbled, you know, with this. I remember St. Nick, St. Nicholas punched out Arius, you know, the original, <laughs> right. the original bad Saint Nick, you know, um, it, there was a battle for truth. And so it's been one and uh, people that are a lot brighter and smarter than us and that were there in that, in that right there in the thick of it, it back in the early church. So we really do value the, the teaching of the church. I, this book by Father Jeffrey Kirby, you know, highlights that uh, it's um, understanding the Bible by LSV. And and uh, and the, and bring the catechism along with you. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different Tally Awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. 
When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak Adventure, plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Bear and Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel. still listening i thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station while well, you asked for it here is more of the bear wasnick adventure aloha welcome back to the bear wasnick adventure we want to invite you to go to our youtube channel the bear wasnick deep adventure youtube channel or, or follow us on facebook uh bear wasnick deep adventure on facebook and keep up with what we're, what, what we're up to. We also invite you to go to deepadventure.com, become a member of the Mama Bears or of the Man Cave, and, uh, and uh, we'll get to have a, a deeper uh, relationship with you if you do that. So we invite you to go do that. We're talking with Father Jeffrey Kirby. He is published by, by OSV Press, by the way. I was just out there in Indiana this summer, Father Kirby. Oh. I, was, I, I did their, the OSV talks that they do. They're like the TED Talks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And we, I was there for like two nights, I think it was, and they, uh, t tremendous, like almost tornadic winds and thunderstorms. Oh there. my goodness! Yeah. Okay. And then the next, <laughs> and then the, the next day with no after after being jet lagged, you know, flying in from Hawaii, and then the next day with no sleep, then getting up and then having million dollars worth of equipment to record these interviews and and uh. so much pressure. It's so funny because. It, they put so much pressure on us. Don't make a mis you know, the, you know, stand here. Uh, if you, you know, just keep on your, t you know, just all this pressure. And then at the very end, they said, but don't worry, you're going to be fabulous. <laughs> be, be yourself, relax, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sleep deprived and jet lagged. And, and I started out, I started out my talk. It was about a, a surfing guide to the soul. It was about the soul and surfing. And I started out my talk. And after the first half a sentence, I lost everything. It wasn't like, I lost track and I skipped ahead. It was just there was nothing left. And I just <laughs> I just looked at the audience and I go, well, every surfer has his wipeouts, and and then we, we press the reset button. But we want to thank Father Jeffrey Kirby for being with us again. Uh, we don't often ask guests back, and we love having Father Jeffrey with us. And he is the pastor of Our Lady of Grace Parish in Indian Land, South Carolina. A moral the more a moral theologian, really works closely with the EWTN. And papal mi missionary of mercy. You're, there, there's these is the initials after your name S yes. T D. What what does what is the what order is that? Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a, my doctorate. It's doctor oh. of sacred theology. Yep. yep. Oh. So, oh. Yep, yep. Okay. So uh, Rome, the Roman system still follows. Um, so it's doctor of sacred theology. I think in the United States, most doctors in theology are PhDs. I but, um, see. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So. Where was that? Where did you Where did you study? Yep, so I studied at Holy Cross, which is the university run by Opus Dei in Rome. So mm. I had a really great education in moral theology from some really eminent theologians who, you know, the great ta you know, task of theology is to think with the church. So we have mm. to think, but you also think and, and reason and reflect with the church, right? So you, know, you, you can't just have thinkers who absent themselves from the tradition of the church but you can't just have the church without the thinking because then theology never progresses, never develops. So some real, you know, good teachers, good professors who, who demanded a thinking with the church and especially in moral theology because, you know, that's the application of our doctrine to our everyday lives, right? So it's, okay, well, you know, we have this body of teaching about Jesus Christ, about the scriptures and so on, but what does that look like now? Like, what is mm -hmm. the application of that? What, what does it look like? And in moral theology, that's its task. Is it takes you know the, the dogmatic doctrine, the, the the core teachings, and it applies them to the life of the Christian today. So, what what are the questions in the 21st century? Uh, how do the scriptures, how does divine wisdom, how does our theological tradition contribute to that? What you know, what and how is a believer called to live? So, so I, I loved moral theology and, and loved being with the professors. Uh, many of my professors helped write portions of the Catechism of the Catholic Church or the compendium of the church's social doctrine. So men who were in service to the church, actively still involved in, in the magisterial office, the teaching office of the church, 
and yet very demanding in terms of their students in terms of thinking with the church i didn't know you know i i just i was just writing to dr craft i'm sure you love dr peter craft oh yes another I'm, surfer by the way yeah. yeah yeah surfer yeah and uh and i remember when i was first exposed i was going to baylor and i went to this uh this class uh about 12 students and a professor a well-noted professor in this boardroom type setting surrounded by those books that smell so good you know the old books yes. i just love them and we went through all the philosophy from i don't know probably started at uh Socrates and worked our way forward. I'm not sure if we hit Aquinas or, or, or Augustine. It was so long ago. But I remember after going through all of that, I just thought, well, I never found one of them that didn't kind of miss the mark. Mm. And I became sort of, I became just dis, kind of, I was 19. I was young to be a junior in college, but I was just, I was just, I'd been living a, a righteous life. You know, I wasn't drinking yet. Hadn't drank a drop yet at that time. I wasn't um, promiscuous. And uh, I was trying very much to be righteous, but I didn't really have a personal walk with God either. I talked to the young priest at the church I was going to, and he was more confused than me. Um, I mm. studied martial arts to get into Eastern religion, and and um, and I was just kind of dis dismayed. And it was it was that so I felt philosophy failed me, the church had failed me, and but I was fortunate because I was invited to a Catholic charismatic uh, prayer group back in the '70s and experienced the power and fusion of the Holy Spirit. Um, but then I got kind of got into what I would say is the shallow end of the pool. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 though I was Catholic, I was uh, mostly in the company of non-denominational Christians, and the whole sola fide, sola scriptura, you know, by faith alone and only the Bible. And then I had this recom coming back to the church through Steve Ray's book, Crossing the Tiber, and I found the early church fathers. And then up above there, I have my books, my, uh, my philosophy books. I found philosophy again. <laughs> I had luckily had teachers like Dr. Peter Kraft, and I found uh, Aquinas's love for Aristotle and and I guess Augustine uh, in, in the Neoplatonist tradition, and I began to realize, oh, we do need to know how to think. <laughs> Amen. You know, I, I didn't understand. I didn't. I didn't. Can, can you dig dig into that a little bit more? The because you know when you when you read the Catholic Catechism. And these books, you're not saying to yourself, oh, I guess I need to accept that. You know, I, it's dogma. I got to accept it. No, when you read them, you go, wow, that really makes sense. Yes. And if that yes. makes sense, then I guess this means this and that means that. And, oh, and that makes sense. Yes, yes. And, and, and all these, all of our teachings are part of a way of life. Mm. You know, so I, I love to, you know, that, that imagery of being on the way. Mm -hmm. you know, before we were called Christians, you know, we were called members of the way. And, and so you can imagine like that the teachings are a part of that. So when we receive a teaching, it's, okay, this is great. Now, how, how do I wrestle with this? And how do I surrender to this? And what creativity is this going to bring out? And how is this going to help me better encounter God and, and serve him in the poor and the weak? Like, so it's, it's, a, it's an interactive, it's a dynamism. And, and, and the teachings are a part of that. So it's not this kind of cold, almost academic, I need to accept this, I need to accept this, I need to accept this. It's, no, this becomes a part of me and, and this becomes a part of the transformation that happens in, in my soul and, and my activity with, with the, the church and, and with God and, and, and among those in need or, and so on. So it's just this way of life that's just kind of like pushing and stuff. So you can imagine that, um, that that's so important, by the way, that in our tradition that if someone were to say that reason has no place or thinking right. has mm -hmm. no place, that's actually a, a false teaching in our tradition, a heresy mm -hmm. called fideism, mm -hmm. that if someone were to say, nope, you just accept it and that's it and just keep going and you just accept this cold doctrine and that's it. And, and so I was like, no, that's not the Catholic tradition. Uh, that's again, we denounce it as fideism. Like, no, like we receive you know, these sacred teachings, we, we have to reflect upon them, we seek understanding, we know that, you know, they kind of get into us, and they transform us and shape us, and, and they demand, they, they cry out, you know, a groan within us for a certain expression and so on. So, so this is how we understand this, and there's that balance, that interactive working between faith and reason. Uh, Pope St. John Paul II said they were the two wings, uh, faith and reason by which the human spirit flies to God, mm -hmm. soars to God. You know, so in, in the Catholic tradition, you know, things are a lot more active. There's a lot more work involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we have to kind of, you know, let that uh, that seed of truth well, enter into our heart and, and, and flourish. Well, so if something is right, is it right because God said so? Uh, is it wrong because God said so? Uh, or, 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 or is there a deeper, I mean, is it, or is it, 
is it true because it's true because it's true and it's right because God is love, God is good, and it, and this is good because God is good, and this is this is, in other words, the right and the wrong of stuff isn't just some arbitrary statement by God. It it's it's consistent with His nature. Amen. It's not just Amen. and so to, to go deeper into understands God God's nature. The other thing about that is going back to the Hebrews four twelve. The word of God is sharper than any two edged sort of able to divide between spirit and soul, and the joints and the marrow. So you have the spirit and soul and body. And I remember as a young man suddenly realizing, wait a minute, when I'm reading scripture, of course it's reading me. But there's three levels to this scripture. There's I called it the 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 bo, the, the body level, which is here's just the story. Then there's the soul level. Here's how to apply it to my life. And there's the spiritual level. This is this is the deeper journey I have with the Lord. And then I re- realized uh, later that the early church fathers plagiarized me. <laughs> <laughs> they already figured that stuff out you know we're talking we're talking with father jeffrey kirby and our time is up we'll have father back if you'll let us because we just love talking with him and the book father is called what understanding the bible oh understanding the bible in two easy lessons <laughs> uh, no and and uh, but it's so it that that is so beautiful the bible is so deep and so rich and it's like you said earlier you, you it's an ocean of depth Amen. it's no longer in the shallow end when you take the the understanding of scripture uh, uh the tradition the teaching of the church along with scripture it's just like a hammer and a chisel you can go so deep and sometimes you know when you're reading the bible you go oh oh that one sentence means that and it's like a little vein of gold and you start chipping away at it chipping away at it and it becomes a mother load of truth you know the few just the few verses about mary if you just dwell on them oh and it just takes you deeper and deeper but without the without the kind of the chisel and the hammer of the of the teaching of the church along with the bible you you, you, sometimes you don't get the traction you don't get deep enough father where can they find you yeah so um my website uh, frkirby.com or on twitter at father kirby and I just have one question. In heaven, will there be football every Saturday? Or is it just going to be just during the fall? It's going to be better than football every Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so where is that in the Bible? We've been talking with Father Jeffrey Kirby. Uh, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wasting Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wasting Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.